have a really good session today with uh, Nasser Al Tamimi uh, from uh, Rasmal, which is a comprehensive platform that enables you on managing your cap table and understand the effect of fundraising. He will be talking to you guys a bit uh, about cap table and data room management. So I have Nasser here with me. So Nasser, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here, with, uh, especially with Taqaddam. Uh, we were looking forward, uh, any, since uh, we've been talking about the session since last year, uh, Maryam. Uh, I hope uh, it's going to be uh, a fruitful uh, session. Um, again, good evening, everyone. Um, we'll be talking today about cap table management and data room management as well, which I personally believe, as I think everyone believes, is a crucial thing uh, towards the journey of fundraising in a startup. Um, uh, myself, I'm Nasr Al Tamimi, co founder and uh, COO of Rasmal. And what we do basically in Rasmal is cap table management and data room management together with investment round scenarios and such. We will hop into that hopefully if we have time by the end of the session. Uh, a brief about my experience. Um, I've been working in the banking and financial sector for 10 years, after which uh, we have decided to uh, come up with Rasmal, uh, the product. Uh, that helps all entrepreneurs uh, achieve their goal and growth. Uh, so I've been full time now with Rasmal uh, as a co-founder and CEO since end of 2019. And please feel free to stop me at any point if you have any question or if you prefer to leave it all at the end. I'm very much flexible. I like giving sessions where it's interactive. Uh, so I prefer if anyone uh, can stop me at any point and discuss any topic in detail. I'll be more than happy to do so. So as a table of content for today's session, we'll be talking from as a, from a top-down uh, point of view. So we'll be talking a bit about why investment rounds, why do startups do investment rounds, which I believe everyone over here knows about it. Uh, types of uh, valuations, uh, evaluation methods of uh, for startups, Forms of investment in startups, which is uh, crucial for cap table management, together with an interesting topic about uh, ESOPs, which I believe everyone is using or will be using in the future. And finally, with data room management. And as mentioned, if we have some time afterwards, we can talk a bit about the developments in the market and the new company law, which will uh, put into effect everything we're going to talk about in this session today. So to kick off, uh, let's mention why do uh, startups do investment rounds? Um, unlike any traditional business where capital injection is required to start operating and start generating revenues and net income from the first year, I would say, and leave the business operating by itself, uh, startups focus on growth. It's purely a growth game a growth in uh, revenue, growth in users, growth in information obtained, obtained, which increases the company's value sometimes, or changing the ways, uh, changing the traditional way of doing things as uh, we've seen in e-commerce and uh, uh, Uber transportation and what we are all doing at, uh, at, at the moment. So in order to achieve the required growth uh, for startups, there, there's always a, a massive amount of cash burn for uh, marketing expenses, attracting talent, developing products, developing updates and such. And in return, this usually uh, results in losses rather than net income as, uh, as compared to traditional businesses. Uh, so to continue operating, uh, startups had to uh, investment rounds. Uh, uh, attracting investors to inject in the company in order to continue operations, expand operations, hit a new market, develop a new product and such. So uh, to tap in a bit about uh, valuations and uh, methods of valuations for startups, uh, we know usually uh, traditional uh, businesses head towards DCF method, which is the discounted cash flow. They will build up some uh, projections depending on previous year's uh, performance and so on. Uh, this is done, done usually in startups, but not 
dependent heavily on discounted cash flow because a lot of startups will remain uh, loss making for a couple of years so it's a bit hard to evaluate uh, on the on the on the loss on the performance of uh, losses based on a DCF uh, method so i'm going to talk a bit about uh, five uh, different uh, valuation methods so the first one is the burkes valuation method which takes into consideration five factors and scoring a price for those five factors between zero to five hundred thousand dollars so if a company is perfect in all aspects it will be capped at a valuation of 2.5 million this is usually used for very early stage startups and the factors are uh, team product if there's a prototype or not if there are strategic relationships or not and the availability of traction and sales um, second we have the scorecard method which uses uh, several factors that are important for uh, the industry that the startup is being evaluated and taking a similar company in that industry where we know the valuation, the valuation is available for that similar company and we either discount certain factors or increase certain factors to reach to a desired uh, valuation or a uh, or, 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 or a valuation that we can depend on sometime. Uh, third, we have the VC method, uh, which is used by VCs by calculating what is the potential exit of that company per se in the next five to seven years. And if that potential exit matches their required return in the VC, but taking into consideration the various investment rounds that are gonna happen in the future and the dilution, that will appear and deciding whether it's an attractive investment to invest in or not. Um, fourth, we have the risk factor method, which uses defines 12 uh, risk factors in a business, such as team, uh, political, uh, political risks, uh, market risk, market size, uh, and such, and scoring between minus two to plus two for each of those factors, uh, comparing it with a similar company. So minus uh, two is uh, is like minus 500,000 on the valuation. Minus one is minus 250,000 on the valuation. Zero, zero, plus one is 250, plus two is 500 and reaching to uh, a, a close enough valuation uh, compared to a similar company in the same uh, business. Uh, finally, we have the most common uh, way that is used mostly by individuals and angel investors for very early stage startup, which is the amount of cash needed to reach the next milestone, meaning from ideation to MVP, from MVP to go to market, from go to market to expansion and such, and in return for that amount to reach the next milestone, uh, they take 15 to 25% of the company. So to throw a small example, let's say a company needs $200,000 to build their product and they reach to an agreement with an investor to give away 20% of the company in return for that amount. Hence, the valuation of the company is a million dollars. So it's 200,000 for 20% resulting in a $1 million uh, company. Uh, forms of investments, uh, unlike traditional businesses where we see uh, common equities, which are, uh, we see it also in, uh, in publicly traded companies and stocks and such, uh, forms of investments in startups, because of the reason of the risk behind it, are, so, are different than the forms in traditional businesses. So uh, we do have common, common shares for founders shares. But for VCs entering at a bit later stage, they enter into with a, with a form called preferred shares. I will dig deep into that and explain the terminologies behind it. Uh, two of the most uh, famous and known terminologies we'll talk about are liquidation preferences and participation rights. And I've chosen those because those that are the factors that have economical effect rather than uh, the other factors and other uh, preferences that affect 
uh, in the legal aspects such as voting rights and, and so on. Um, we'll talk a bit, a bit more about uh, convertible notes as well. And we'll, uh, we'll touch base on discounts and caps, which we usually see in convertible notes in safes and kisses notes and uh, convertible instruments uh, in general. So to start off, let's start with the convertible instruments. And after explaining the terminologies, uh, we do have the two examples to show exactly what do the terminologies mean in an economical and uh, numerical uh, effect. So convertible instrument, as most of us know, uh, is a type of debt instrument that converts into equity in the future. Typically after uh, another investment round, which could be, which is most which is an, a price round, meaning an equity round uh, in the future. And the reason why investors had to convertible instruments is that they have an interest in the company, but probably it's very early stage to to evaluate to value the company or the the, the investor and the and the founders didn't reach to a ground of valuation. So what happens is that the investor invests in the company with a convertible instrument with the promise of being converted into equity in the next investment round. But having said that, and that the investor injected in the company before the next investment round, they require some sort of uh, favorable terms uh, and favorable favorable uh percentage of the company in the next investment round so what is usually done uh, it, it either includes a cap or a discount or both so to explain a bit about the cap the cap is the conversion of the debt instrument will be capped on a certain valuation so if the company is valued at a higher valuation in the next investment round than the cap the convertible instrument will be converted to that cap and in this way the investor will ensure that the comp that, that that the convertible instrument will be converted on a reasonable valuation if the company should skyrocket and the investor won't lose the opportunity to own a decent amount of equity in that company. And we'll have an example about that. Or having a discount, which is a discount on the future valuation. So uh being converted at a lower valuation than the original valuation the next investment round, which will result in a higher percentage of equity as compared to the future investors that will be entering into the company. So uh, I know I'm talking a lot, but let's head into examples to make things more clear. And I'm sure most knows the, uh, most of you know those terminologies and its effects. So, the first example, a convertible note that is a convertible note of $1 million and the valuation of the company in the next investment round is $20 million. And the convertible instrument has uh, a discount of 20% on the next valuation. So on the left side, we'll see if there wasn't any discount, the conversion will be 1 million divided by the 20 million, which is the convertible instrument's value divided by the future, uh, the next round valuation, which will result in the convertible instrument holder having an ownership in the company of 5%. So owning 5% of a $20 million company. However, given that uh, the convertible instrument includes a 20% discount, the conversion will be 1 million divided by and 80% of the 20 million. So 1 million divided by 16 million, which will result in an ownership of 6.25 rather than the 5%. So it's giving a, a favorable percentage to the convertible instrument holder rather than having no uh, favorable uh, terms over uh, the next uh, investment round investors. Uh, a convertible instrument that has a cap now. Uh, so a, a convertible instrument of 1 million and the same example, the company is valued at 20 million the next investment round, but here we have a cap of 10 million. So on the left side, uh, we have the same scenario, uh, 1 million divided by 20, which is 
However, since the convertible instrument has a cap uh, term of uh, 10 million, the ownership will be 1 million divided by 10 million, resulting in an ownership of 10% of a $20 million company. But if a convertible instrument has both, let's say the same convertible instrument has uh, the discount of 20 and the cap of 10. We've seen that on the discount of 20, the, it will result in 6.25, and on the cap, it will result on uh, 10% uh, ownership. The conversion will be to uh, on the on the most favorable result to the investor. So in that case, and this example, the conversion will be on the cap, and the investor will own 10% of a $20 million company. Uh, do you guys have any uh, questions on convertible notes so far? No, uh, but uh, I think there's uh, there's a different type of convertible notes. Uh, safe, it is also the same. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So safe notes and kiss notes are uh, mm -hmm. standardized convertible notes done by uh, by, by Y Combinator. That, y Combinator uh, to to standardize the terms in convertible notes. So uh, here we're, we're explaining in general convertible notes and the terms uh, in, involved in it. Um, so you do have the kiss note, the safe note, you have Uqal's convertible note, which is an Islamic convertible note by uh, VCPEA, approved by VCPEA here in Saudi. You have other convertible notes that are drafted by uh, lawyers. So the purpose here was explaining the two terminologies and two uh, methods of conversion, uh, which are found actually in uh, kiss notes and safe notes as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Do you have any further questions? I think we're all good, Nasser. Yeah. So moving forward, uh, we'll be talking a bit about uh, preferred shares. So uh, preferred shares are shares, uh, uh, but unlike common equities, they do have certain preferences and give privileges to its holders as compared to common equity holders. So uh, as, uh, as mentioned previously, uh, we'll talk about liquidity preferences and participation rights, which are terms uh, effective and give, uh, uh, effective in, in an exit scenario and give uh, preferred shareholders uh, a favorable position in uh, acquisitions of uh, companies. So a liquidity preference uh, is a clause in the contract determining who gets paid first in an acquisition uh, scenario. So uh, either an acquisition or a liquidation or a bankruptcy, uh, and usually preferred shareholders will get back their investment before uh, before distributing the exit proceeds among all, all shareholders. So it's either their investment in full or 1.5x of their investment or two x's from their investments. It's usually one x. And the reason behind that uh, is that VCs most likely will enter into a company uh, at a later stage and at a valuation which is a bit high. Um, and in some situations, uh, the company will receive an offer for an acquisition, which could be a bit lower than the valuation that the VC entered into. So uh, having the liquidity preference, the VC or the preferred shareholder will get the opportunity and the security of receiving their whole investment in the company and afterwards determining uh, the, dis the distribution of ex exit proceeds. So after the liquidity preference, there are participation rights and participation rights determine the preferred shareholders, what will they get uh, in terms of distribution of exit proceeds after the liquidity preference. So it's more, uh, you can think about it as a waterfall analysis and what we usually see as puzzles, uh, the empty buckets and the water and what gets full before uh, before the next. Uh, participation rights, there are three types of participation rights. Uh, I have examples about the first two today, and the third is a bit complicated to have an example about. 
uh, I can take it offline uh, if anyone is uh, interested in knowing more about it. So we do have uh, the first type, which is non-participating. And in that clause gives the preferred shareholder the right to either activate their liquidity preference and get their investment in full and leave the table or convert into common equity and give away their right in the liquidity preference and participate and share in the exit proceeds uh, on a pro rata basis on their ownership, uh, percentage of ownership in the company. Uh, the second, which is a full participation, which I believe is a bit harsh on startups, uh, gives the preferred shareholders the right to get their money first, which is the liquidity preference, and afterwards convert into common equity and participate fully in uh, the remaining exit proceeds. Uh, the cap participation is somewhere in the middle. So giving the preferred shareholders the right to get the, to activate the liquidity preference by getting their money first and then participating a bit in, in the remaining exit proceeds and reaching a cap where they stop participating in the exit proceeds and the distribution will be among uh, the other shareholders. Uh, so it gives a bit security on the, on the participating of exit proceeds of the preferred shareholders to the remaining uh, shareholders. So it's not like the preferred shareholders having uh, the right to own everything for themselves uh, compared to the full participation. So let's go to some examples to understand a bit more about them. Uh, so we have in the first example, uh, a preferred shareholder of uh, that owns 20 million in the, in the, that invested 20 million in the company at a pre-money valuation of 80 million. So uh, the post money valuation is 100 and the percentage of ownership is 20%. So 20 million of a $100 million uh, company. And we have a liquidity preference of 1x, but none participating. So what will happen here is that if, if, the, if, if an acquisition of less than 20 million, uh, if, if, of less than 100 million uh, is accepted by the company, uh, let's say 99 million, 20% uh, of the 99 million is 19.8. So in that event, the preferred shareholder will get the 20 million back rather than the 19.8 and the remaining uh, proceeds will be distributed among all shareholders to to make this a bit more clear let's say uh, an exit uh, of 80 million uh, was proposed what will happen in that situation rather than getting 20 percent of the 80 which is 16 million the preferred shareholders will get their whole 20 million and the remaining 60 million of the uh, 60 million of the 80 will be distributed among all shareholders. Uh, what will happen if if an acquisition of more than 100 million is there, or an exit of more than 100 million is there, is that the preferred shareholders, rather than getting 20 million in total, they will convert into common equity and get 20 million. Uh, get 20 percent of whatever exit amount is there so this is the example on the right if an exit of 100 million uh, 101 million is on the table 20 million 20 percent of 101 million results in 20.2 million so preferred shareholders in that case will forego their uh, liquidity preference right and transfer uh, uh, convert into common equity and share in the exit uh, amount with their percentage of ownership. Uh, another example, uh, the same 20 million at a pre-money valuation of 80, but here we have one X liquidity preference and full participation. So what, what this means exactly is that the preferred shareholders will get their 20 million and then uh, share 20% of whatever is left. So we'll take an example on the left, which uh, which is, is exaggerated, but, but to know a bit, uh, to understand the whole idea behind it. So if an acquisition appeared of less than 20 million, 
uh, the preferred shareholders will get the whole exit proceeds. So they're secured up to uh, 20 million of their investment. So let's say if an acqu acquisition is there for uh, any any amount of uh, that is more than 20 million, which is the one on the right, what will happen is that the preferred shareholders will get their whole 20 million investment and 20 million, 20 percent of any remaining remaining amount. So to take an example, if an exit of 25 million appeared, the preferred shareholders will get 20 million and 20% 20 of the 5 million, which is 1 million, the resulting in 21 million going to the preferred shareholders in whole, uh, at, uh, at, as a total, and the 4 million remaining will be distributed among other shareholders. So those, those examples are a bit exaggerated, but to know exactly what is the effect. And the reason behind uh, the liquidity preference and the participation rights, in addition to securing the preferred shareholders investment amount is also to push uh, the founders to accept uh, exits that are high in amount and will uh, benefit all shareholders. So we see on the example on the right, the 25 million will result in only 4 million for all shareholders other than the preferred, share, uh, preferred shareholder. So it's a way of encouragement also to push their limits to uh, have an acquisition that is fair for everyone and uh, that that will be actually a success uh, to everyone, uh, every stakeholder in the company. So this is, uh, those are the two examples I have on preferred uh, shareholders and uh, I'm open to any questions if anything isn't clear. No. Then, please, because uh, the, we see we think about the, the, the difficulty if we if the participate is going pull us be back to so higher in the investment in the future. Is that right? We understand. Uh, I didn't uh, hear you well at all. Yeah, when 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 the when the liquidation with the full participation, it will be effect more higher in the, in the exit when we the, the long. Okay. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, as I explain, I, I as I have uh, I have said yeah. that. The two examples are a bit uh, exaggerated, but imagine um, imagine three and four rounds of preferred shareholders with different participation rights. So you can know now uh, you can imagine how tricky it is and how complicated it is to calculate actually the waterfall analysis of uh, of the exit scenario. Thank you. Welcome. Great. So uh, let's talk a bit about uh, the investment rounds inputs that are important uh, to, to, to keep an eye on uh, to decide whether to go ahead with the investment round or not. Uh, of course, uh, the investment date, uh, because this is the date in which uh, the, the convertible notes will be converted uh, will be converted to equities. Also, this date will affect as well the ESOPs and vesting schedules that are available uh, in the company. Uh, the pre-money valuation in which uh, uh, the amount of the, per the percentage of ownership of the new investor will be dependent on. Uh, the investment amount to calculate the new share, uh, the, the share price and uh, the percentage of ownership of the new investor. Required option pools because this amount will, uh, uh, will dilute previous owners uh, before uh, the new investor enters into the, uh, into the company. Liquidity preferences to know exactly the effects on exit. So, uh, we've talked a lot about now uh, investment uh, terminologies and investment forms. Uh, to talk a bit about cap table management and what does it mean exactly. So we've seen the complications over here, uh, convertible instruments that aren't converted yet, in which they are not registered in the article of association or the ownership of the company, preferred shares uh, and preferences available in contracts, uh, also, ESOPs available in contracts and not uh, available clear to the eye in their uh, 
to imagine uh, their effect. So cap table management in a nutshell is actually to register everything that is related to ownerships in, uh, in startups, to have a clear view about everything in the company, who owns what and what is the effect in another investment round and who will own what amount in the future, meaning the convertible instrument holders when they convert into equity in next investment rounds. Uh, so to talk a bit about also about uh, ESOPs, uh, employee stock option plans. Uh, so options are actually uh, shares in the company that the company owns, no, one's, no one owns it. All ownerships are on a fully diluted basis, uh, excluding the option pool. Uh, and the reason of giving ESOPs to employees is to attract talents that are mostly expensive uh, in a market value for, for, for startups. So to compensate them on a salary cut probably, uh, ESOPs are given to employees to encourage them to own in the company in the future. Also, to align interests between comp between uh, employees and the company itself. So if, if, if an employee own, has ESOPs and the right to own shares in the company, they'll be more motivated to work harder to grow this company because they have actually a stake in the company. So ESOPs are usually given to uh, employees uh, with uh, terms to own the right to own in the company in the future. So we have a, a, a vesting schedule uh, that includes a time frame on over which the employee will have the right to own in the company. And usually it comes along with a terminology called cliff, which is the amount of time that the employee will not own any shares in the company, after which they will start, uh, shares will start vesting and ownership uh, will occur. So to take a bit, to, sm to take a small example, let's say uh, we have an offer to an employee to grant them the right to own 48 shares in the company over the next four years on monthly basis, meaning 48 uh, shares divided by 48 months, uh, one share per month. But uh, the vesting plan will usually include a cliff and let's say that the cliff is 12 months, meaning from month one until month 12, uh, the employee will not have the right to own any number of shares, uh, mostly looked at as the probation period uh, to start owning uh, shares in the company. And after month, thir month 13, the 12 shares that, are, uh, that were accumulating during the cliff uh, will be activated and the employee will own will have the right to own them at month 13 and afterwards owning one share uh, per month uh, moving forward. Um, so to, to, to go back to cap table management, uh, granting an access or uh, a tool for employees as well to view, their vesting schedule and knowing exactly where the company is heading and the valuation of the company uh, gives some sort of comfort to the employee regarding their uh, ownership and the stake in the company and what the company has reached so far as well. Uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, the investment amount and investment rounds. Uh, and this will, this also is related to the valuation method I've explained, which is the amount of investment and 15 to 25% in return. So to know what is the investment amount we need in the investment round, uh, most the most important question, what have we achieved so far? And what do we want to achieve afterwards? And what is the time frame for that? And the utilization uh, that will be done with this amount of cash. And in return, we'll decide 15 to 25% ownership uh, in the company uh, for that amount. Uh, usually investment rounds are uh, good enough for a runway of 15 to 18 months. Having lower uh, runway than that could be a bit risky. Uh, having runways more than that 
uh, could result in, in in having in selling out uh, shares uh, at a lower valuation than we expect. So rather than obtaining a huge amount of investment in the beginning, which is sufficient to run the business for three years, uh, let's say this will result in giving away 20% uh, of the company. We're good enough with half of that amount and 10% uh, in exchange and growing the company and doing another investment round afterwards. So the, 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 there's, a, there's a thin line between uh, a fair amount of investment uh, of an investment round and a lower, a lower amount at a higher amount. So uh, calculating exactly the utilization and the runway and the next milestones and the future outlook of the company uh, is a very important thing as well to decide the investment amount in each investment round. So let's talk a bit about uh, data room and the pitch and uh, what is usually uh, done and the preparation prepare, preparation for such. Uh, what is mostly important to the to the to the investors in sharing the data room is the is the pitch deck, and this will include. The company's objective, why was it established, the problem it is solving, and how is it being solved, which is the solution. And one of the important things that is usually uh, missed in pitch decks is the timing. Is the timing right or wrong? Are we way behind in the timing uh, of that solution, meaning there are lots of players that uh, uh, acquired almost all of the market or still we do have a chance to come in with that solution market size is an attractive product which is, which will be growing uh, in the future or is it a small market that will not generate uh, an attractive amount of revenues uh, the product and an explanation of it uh, competition uh, who is available in the market and how are we differentiating ourselves from those competitors uh, marketing strategy, how are we going to attract users and uh, clients? Uh, traction, if there is and if the company started operations or not. Uh, the business model and the revenue model and how are we uh, going to generate uh, cash? The team, of course, what all investors uh, focus on and the strength of, of the abilities and the expertise to run that particular business, the knowledge and the experience behind the team, uh, the founding team in that particular uh, industry, let's say. Uh, expectations, which is the financial uh, projections and being reasonable in the financial projections and justifying, being able to justify each number, the funding requirement and where it will be used. So this is basically for prepare, uh, preparing the data room. And after that, uh, and if the investment is attractive to, uh, if the opportunity is attractive to the investors, uh, other legal documents will be required, such as Article of Association, uh, the CR, and uh, uh, agree, uh, employees' agreements and such. But those are the most important things that shall be uh, updated frequently in the data room to always to being always prepared for any investment round rather than losing time by back and forth uh, emails with investors in any investment round. So uh, it's always great to have also a two minute uh, pitch uh, in which we will remove a lot of what is available in the pitch deck uh, and focusing on what does the company do uh, what is the solution, uh, what is the market size, and if there's any traction so far or not, what is our competitive advantage uh, as opposed to uh, other competitors in the market, the business model, and convincing uh, the expertise behind the team and that they are capable of running it, and the funding requirement. And uh, I'll focus a lot uh, here on uh, the competitive advantage because most sophisticated investors will actually know the main 
uh, players in the market in each uh, industry or type of uh, type of uh, uh, startup. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's very important to always being prepared for an elevating pitch, which is a 30 second kind of thing to explain the business. So what does the company do? What is the market size and what you have achieved so far in order to take the discussion further at uh, offline and digging more into uh, details. So as general advisors for uh, cap table management and uh, data room management, um, companies shall be organized from day one uh, rather than going back and preparing and cleaning up the data room after any investment round, things start to become, become more complicated. Uh, closing the investment round uh, very fast and going back to work because it is seriously uh, a full-time job to close an investment round that is time consuming and will deviate a lot, uh, a lot of time from uh, the business. Uh, and for that reason, the founder shall be the person who takes care of closing the investment round. You cannot hire a financial consultant or a lawyer to go and talk about the business. No one knows how to no one knows to how to explain the business more than the founder uh himself and being clear and honest from day one not exaggerating with projections or uh tractions which haven't been uh achieved uh at the end of the day investors are are uh are going to invest put their money in the company they need to be they need to have a clear and honest picture and a truthful picture about the company they will be investing in uh, so this is in a nutshell uh, what I have about cap table management, the data room management. Uh, and as promised, uh, we have some time to talk a bit more about the developments in the market, the new company law, and what does Ras Mal offer in cap table management and data room management, and the agreement we have with the Qaddam as well. So before going into that, uh, if anyone has any questions on the session as a whole, uh, please feel free to jump in and uh, ask your question. Yeah, go ahead, Clark. Nasser, thanks so much for the presentation. Really helpful information. Um, I have a question about the ESOP percentage. Um, what's for, for Saudi investors or other investors that you've seen, what's kind of um, a, a healthy range that they look for um, in, in kind of ensuring that there's enough, you know, shares to go around for future, um, for future employees or for existing employees? Great. Uh, interesting question. Um, it's, it's always uh, uh, depends on the structure of employees in the company and the qualifications of, uh, of founders as well. And what is missing uh, in the team as a whole to attract? Uh, so to, to explain that further, let's say a company doesn't have uh, a founder who has background in tech and technology. In that event, we you can sense that uh, a certain portion and a bigger portion of ESOPs will go to uh, seniors in the tech team, probably a CTO and uh, uh, elite tech so the percentage the the, the pool in that uh, in that situation will be higher than other uh, other companies but i would say 5% is reasonable to start off with and you can always increase the option pool uh, after uh, as you go uh, and as you grow but uh, increasing the option pool at a later stage uh, makes more sense rather than going big from the beginning because this will result as well in having a smaller percentage of increase in the option pool uh, given that the company's valuation will be higher in the future rather than uh, compared to uh, early stages as well. So uh, uh, in a nutshell, I would say 5% in early stages is good enough to start off with. Uh, 
have you seen as startups go through the stages um, limits like them, like investors wanting to see like, oh, that's too high or is it, have you seen it go the other direction? Uh, not really, uh, because uh, option pools by the end of the day, uh, if it's high and hasn't been utilized, uh, it won't be a problem at all, because what will happen in an exit situation or an acquisition is that the options will uh, be cleared and it will go back as ownerships to the existing owners. So uh, we've seen a lot. The other side of it is that uh, options aren't enough to uh, hire a lot of employees. So investors are requiring additional option pools rather than lowering the option pools. But again, it needs to be reasonable as well. So if, if, uh, if a company has 30% option pool, this is, this is a lot. Thanks, that's helpful. Most you're welcome. Anyone else, guys, or shall we uh, continue? Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, after the cliff will end, uh, when the employees and where is the start they getting their uh, after, after the ASAP end, they get already 25% or no? Yes, start from the, the year after the ASAP end or the cliff end. No, uh, well, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, they will get the 25% of their ESOPs uh, after the cliff in the example we just uh, explained. And the remaining 75% will be vested on monthly basis. So uh, going back to the example, 48 shares for 48 months and 12 months of cliff, uh, the total duration is 48 uh, months. So it's 12 months as a cliff and 36 uh, without a cliff. So at month 13, the whole 12 uh, shares will be vested and they'll have the ownership, the right to own them. And for the remaining 36 shares will be vested on monthly basis for 30, 36 months. Yeah. Uh, another question, please. Uh, and the cap table, you, you mentioned before that you, you should own it, you should be prefer to use uh, tools. Why? Why? Excel is not enough to manage the no, it, cap table? It, even Excel is, is, a, is a good tool, but uh, Excel is a bit hey. it's not friendly for the eye. Uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of people understand it. Uh, it might include some mistakes if it's downloaded online, but what I said by what I mentioned by what I meant by tools is either platforms or Excel rather than not using anything uh -huh. else completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, you have uh, any recommended uh, recommendation, any tools that you used is very clear or very useful, like Clara <laughs> Rasmal. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you give it free when we, uh, no problem. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of tools actually uh, to use cap table management. Uh, globally, uh, you, there are lots of them. Uh, regionally, uh, there's Rasmal and Clara. Clara is more focused on the legal aspect. Rasmal is more focused on the financial aspect. Um, and we'll uh, I'll explain a bit about our features and what we have offered for Taqaddam's cohort as well, uh, after uh, after answering any other questions. Very good. Thank you. Most likely welcome, Nasser. Anyone else, guys? Do we have any to... further questions? Everyone, do we have any further questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> It seems, oh, okay. Matthew, Logisa, you raised your hand. Go ahead. You raised your hand. Yes, yes. Uh, the question is when you offer the employee share options, what is the maximum period we can keep for them to uh, opt for it? So, okay. if, uh, yeah, is, is there a maximum period? 
Interesting. This is the expiry date to uh, to to buy back the options. So uh, usually uh, it's somewhere around uh, six months. Uh, less than that is a bit harsh for the employee. More than that is a bit, bit harsh for uh, the startup itself. Uh, why would it be harsh for the startup? Because as you do investment rounds, there are dilutions that gonna happen for the ESOPs and uh, the owners in the company uh, as a whole. So you'll end up with having a mixed uh, structure rather than having a clear one. So usually six months is good enough uh, for the employee to buy uh, to 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 buy their options and the vested uh, the vested uh, shares that they have. Uh, and Sorry. In in your uh, sorry, in your previous example of uh, forty-eight months with uh, forty-eight shares, for example, with a cliff of twelve months, that mm -hmm. means uh, after the twelve months, another six months to claim the first twelve shares, or twelve uh, six six months after the end of the forty-eight months. How is it working? It's six months uh, after each vesting occurs. So you have six months after the twelve. Six months after the 13, after the 14, and after the 15. So uh, at month 16, at month 18, let's say, if you don't buy whatever you have uh, up to month 12, uh, you, you, it lapses. It, it will elapse and you won't have the right to own them. Uh, from month, let's say, uh, 44, uh, six months after that, which is month 50 you'll have the right to own them. Uh, after month 48, if the, if the, if the employee uh, resigns, they also still have the right to own uh, their shares uh, uh, until six months after that. So it's six months after the uh, vesting of each, uh, each amount of shares. Okay. And is it okay that, you know, uh, the vesting happens on a yearly basis? Can we define it like that? So that means the first vesting will be end of the 12 months, second vesting will be end of 24 months. So yeah. each of that, is, that it's, is allowed? It's a lot, but uh, you can do that. Um, mostly it's, it's, it's a monthly basis or quarterly basis. Uh, but again, depending on the, on, the, on the preference of the company or the employee, you can alter it as, uh, as the, the way you want it. Okay. Uh, just one more question. Um, when a startup is on an equity round, normally VCs ask you to allocate the ESOPs. Yeah. So what is a normally accepted maximum percentage? Uh, is it say around 10%? Uh, the the 10? VCs prefer to have? Yeah, 10 is a bit on the uh, on the higher range, I would say. So 10 is a maximum amount uh, a startup will shall uh, accept. Uh, as mentioned previously, the norm is five or 7%. Uh, those are the mostly uh, used in all cases. 10% is a bit high. Okay. Sorry, just the last one more question. Yeah, in, our, um, in our cap table, for example, if you have some employees who invested into the shares of the company and they are and they till for some ESOPs, do we need to classify their investment, direct investment as shareholders or do we club it along with the ESOP to show that these are employees shares? So the, they are um, investors and uh, employees at the same time? Correct. Oh. That's a tough one. Uh, actually, I would say uh, it will go as an investment at the begin uh, at the beginning. This is this is the way to record it because it was actually an injection and an increase in capital. If uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Initially, yes, but then after that, they're entitled for the ESOP. So yeah, uh, it will, in yeah, it will be recorded as an investment. Uh, this is similar to uh, having a vesting schedule on uh, founders' shares as well. Some uh, some investors do require that. So it can be uh, recorded as an investment and a vesting plan will be given for their shares afterwards. But in that case, it will be a 
uh, wrong declaration, right? Because your ESOP will go as investment directly. So maybe actually you have 10% ESOP, but whereas you may be showing only 6% as ESOP, the balance 4% will come as investment directly. That will be wrong, right? No, what happens, you'll have it in two ways. So the initial investment will be recorded as an investment and uh, they'll have their uh, shares uh, in the company accordingly. And the remaining amount uh, of the ESOP and the remaining amount of investments that will go during time will be recorded uh, as uh, ESOPs. ESOP, okay, okay, yeah. okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. We also have a question from Wala. Wala, go ahead. You are muted, Wala. You are muted, uh, I cannot hear you. Yeah, okay. So, um, just one cl cl clarification. So, when we talk about uh, ESOP, we, we talk about a, a liquidity pool or an employee pool of 10% of the company. Okay. But when we talk about 5%, 7%, it's 5% of the 10%. Uh, no, no. Actually, I said uh, rather than having 10% ESOPs, you can have 5% as a whole. Yeah, of the whole company or mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, employee, employees pool? Of the whole company. Okay, which is too much. <laughs> no, no, not for, uh, not for one employee. So... Uh, you mentioned 10% uh, option pool for all employees. What I was saying is 5% option pool for all employees. Mm. Okay, and uh, it depends on the, the, the involvement of the employee. If he's full-time, part-time, C-level, uh, what are your recommendations when it comes to C-level who are not full-time working? Uh, my recommendation is first to have uh, full-time C-levels, uh, never have a part-time C-level. They are uh, very, very, very expensive. Yeah, that's what, th this is where the ESOPs uh, kick in. So, for example, let's say the market price of uh, C-level in a certain position is uh, an, an, a monthly salary of 100,000, throwing in examples. And we can afford paying uh, 50. Again, I'm throwing examples. Mm -hmm. So what exactly we will do is offer the 50,000 uh, uh, monthly salary and compensate with ESOPs that will result in a higher amount than 50,000 a month. So we say, we say for example, uh, that the 50,000 deficit in the, in the, in the, in the offer uh, mm -hmm. results in 750,000 for the next uh, year and a half, which is 50,000 multiplied by 18. Uh, what we'll do if the company's valuation is, let's say, uh, 10 million, we can give ESOPs of 1% or 1.5%, which will actually uh, compensate on the deficit in that amount. So 1% of a 10 million, 1% uh, of a million dollar company is actually 1 million as compared to the 750. Yeah, so you get, my, my, you get my point. So you start uh, negotiating on the deficit in the offer and in the cash and compensate, uh, compensating, uh, compensating it with higher than this deficit in terms of ESOPs. Okay, can we reach out to you by email? If we have a yes. real exercise to do. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'm typing in my email to okay. everyone in the chat. Shukran. Have fun. Uh, there's, there's a question. Uh, from today. Aziz. Huh? There is a question from Aziz. Yes. No, no, uh, well, it wasn't a question, just an observation. Just thanks for the talk, Nasr. Uh, Great. So, Perfect. Uh, do you have any further questions or? 
I think we're good to go. Great. Yeah. I'll, I'll wrap up with the recent development that happened in uh, the company's law in Saudi Arabia and a bit about what we do in Ras Mal and our offer to Taqaddam to wrap it up. And please feel free to reach out to me in person uh, uh, anytime. Uh, more than happy to help everyone in uh, Taqaddam's uh, network. So uh, before uh, the beginning of this year, so what usually was happening is that startups were establishing companies in free zones. The IFC, uh, ADGM came in Delaware, uh, you name it. And the reason behind that, is that was that the, the Saudi company law did not support uh, preferred shares for uh, small companies, also did not support convertible instruments and ESOPs of employees. Uh, interestingly, what the Ministry of Commerce, together with the CMA, were working on a project to develop <laughs> the company law in Saudi. Uh, this, this kicked off somewhere around 2019. And in the 28th of June of last year, 2022, uh, the Council of Ministers approved the new company law to be in force uh, during Q1 of 2023. Uh, the new company law came in with a lot of developments that support uh, the business ecosystem as a whole. But let's talk more about the startup ecosystem and how the company law the new company law will change uh, the whole picture uh, after it is enforced. Uh, the new company law focused on establishing a new type of company that is tailored for startups and their needs, which is called the simple joint stock company uh, to accommodate for the needs of entrepreneurs and VCs uh, as well. So, what exactly is included in the simplified uh, joint stock companies? Uh, first of all, the issuance of multiple asset classes with different rights. So this will, uh, this will uh, remove the pain of not having the right or being able to issue preferred shares to VCs. And this is why startups were establishing companies in free zones when VCs uh, in, uh, decide to invest in the company in a price round. Also, the second point is, uh, is giving the right to uh, companies to issue ESOPs and vesting schedules to attract uh, talents. Uh, and we see, we, we believe that even SMEs, not only startups will head towards using ESOPs. So, Throwing in a small example, um, a newly restaurant that will open in the near future and a head chef that is running the restaurant, which is an expensive talent to acquire. This will also be compensated in ESOP, similar to the, the example we just spoke with uh, Wala about. So compensating the, uh, the salary with the ESOPs in the company. Uh, also, uh, the, new the, the new company law uh, approved uh, using uh, debt instruments that will be converted into equity in the future, which is simply convertible notes. Uh, this wasn't the case uh, before the new company law. Convertible notes were signed with the investors, but weren't enforceable uh, legally in the courts of Saudi Arabia. Uh, finally, strengthening corporate governance by using uh, technology as well. So uh, it will be uh, easier for startups and uh, companies that are under the simple joint stock company form uh, to use uh, platforms for their, min the, their minutes of meetings and board meetings to record them rather than heading to the uh, official platforms of uh, CMA, which are expensive uh, for startups. 
so finally, to talk about uh, Ras Mal and what we do and how do we intersect as well with the new company law. Uh, what cap what, what Ras Mal offers is three main things: uh, cap table management, uh, which is a tool to register common shares, preferred shares with their preferences and uh, participation rights, convertible notes with their uh, terminologies as well, and ESOPs together with their vesting schedules, and having various uh, accessibilities in the platform for everyone in the company. So also sharing and access to employees to view their vesting schedules and ownerships in the company, as well as running scenario models for invest future investment rounds or for potential exits to evaluate the conversion of convertible notes and the dilution of all investors. Uh, also, the example we talked about uh, increasing uh, the option pool before the next investment round that is subject, uh, that is required sometimes by VCs, as well as measuring the impact of uh, different uh, terminologies and uh, preferences and preferred shares on future potential exits to view what exactly would be the effect in the future if we accept certain terms to have a better negotiation power before closing the investment round. Uh, second, we have the financial analysis tools. Uh, we have the cash burn analysis and runway financial analysis of financial statements and loan repayments calculators. Uh, one thing to point out, all the feet, all the tools I have just explained can be printed in PDF as reports or also can be added to the data room, which is the third uh, pillar we serve, the governance aspect. We have minutes of meeting management and e-voting in addition to the data room, which is uh, and uh, a main data room for the company to store their documents in, in addition to store the printable reports of Rasmal. Also having the ability to create shareable data rooms to external parties such as potential investors and uh, adding an expiry date to uh, view that folder or an automatic watermark of the recipient's email if the documents are downloaded as well to avoid any leaks of information. So we, our uh, main package is priced at uh, 3,588 reals a year for a, for a company with unlimited number of users and 10 gigabytes of storage. And we do have a 30% discount for Taqaddam's uh, network resulting in uh, 2,512 reals a year for each company. Uh, we'll be more than happy to assist you guys if you're interested in the platform and more than happy to uh, get in contact if you have any questions regarding cap table management, investment rounds, data room and such. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, be with you guys today in this workshop. Uh, if you have any other further questions before uh, ending the session, we'll be more than happy to uh, answer it. Do we have any questions for Nasser? Uh, hi, Nasser. This is Luisa Javier from Guayaquil, CEO. Uh, I want to thank you. No, honestly, I, I don't have further questions. Honestly, I think the, the service you're providing is quite valuable because as companies are growing, things are getting more complicated and having control of all those aspects is now becoming, you know, like a key aspect, as you said. Uh, for reaching out to you is directly with the, the contact email or if we want to see more about the, the options you're offering directly to you or what would be the, the right approach? Uh, sure, you can reach out to me directly and we will we'll be more than happy to assist you guys. Thank you so much, Nasa. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much. That, do we have any final questions before we are able to release Nasir? I think all is good. And with that, it was a really good session. I, I'm sure a lot of the startups have benefited a lot from this session.
And yes, Abdel Nasser, the session is recording. I will be posting it soon. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Nasser. I hope you have a great day ahead. You too. And I reminded everyone, we, we shared the discount code that you have with uh, Rasnal on the chat. On the perks page, you can have all the details on how you can redeem this amazing discount with Rasmal. And I hope everyone has a great day ahead. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.